Good morning, church. And good morning, online campus. Great to see you at home. Mwah, mwah, mwah. We miss you. We love you, but we totally respect your choice to worship from afar. We are so, so excited about what God is going to say today. We start a brand new series called the Overcomer Series. All right? You see this up here. April's got this beautiful picture up here. And we got these are, well, not that one. Go back to the other one here, April. This one right here. These words like uh, rejection and shame and, and, and comparison and fear and anger and depression and anxiety, all these things. For the first time in history, Pastor Bill and I are going to tag team a series, and I'm fired up about it. He's already got one ready on uh, depression coming up here in a couple weeks. It's going to be awesome. And I'm fired up. I want to tell you a little story here because when I read it, it spoke to me. It's a little story about a guy named EJ. Okay, EJ was just six years old, and he invited his best friend over for a sleepover on a Friday night. Y'all remember sleepovers? Like, we could, do, we could do those, right? He had a sleepover, and he brought his other six-year-old six year friend over, and they were upstairs, and they were playing in the room, and the dad walked by, and he noticed they were inside, and it was a beautiful day, and he backed up and says, hey, why don't you guys go play outside? It's a beautiful day. The sun's getting low, but you still got another hour or so. He's like, well, Dad, that sounds great. You know what? We do have that awesome field over there, and that's where all the kids love to come, and they would play kickball and soccer and all these great, you know, whatever that, kick the can or whatever it is. Getting a little old here, so I don't remember what, what we play. <laughs> Freeze tag, things like that. And he said, oh, that's an awesome idea. And the little boy went to the window, and he looked out, and he said, uh, sir, there's a problem. The one problem about getting to the field was you have to go through this. You had to go through the dark, scary patch of woods. Because they lived out a little bit, right? The little boy walked over to the window and he said, um, sir, can I ask you a question? And the dad said, yeah, absolutely. What you got? He said, are those woods safe? What a great, horrible question to ask. <laughs> Well, those woods, I mean, is anything safe, right? And the dad thought about it. He said, well, well you know, little buddy, what, what do you mean by that? And he said, well, I mean, is there things in the woods that can hurt me, like other coyotes and snakes and spiders? And I mean, the dad couldn't lie to him. Well, he looked at him and he says, well, <laughs> yes, all those things are there. I have seen some coyotes. And yeah, we have snakes and spiders. They're everywhere. Believe me, they're everywhere. And as he was saying this, this guy's eyes got really big. You know, he's like, biggest sauce. He says, then I don't want to go play in that field with your son. And he said, why not? And his answer was classic. In fact, this guy remembered it and wrote a book about it. It's how I know this story. His answer was this. He said, sir, I'm not the bravest guy around. <laughs> Isn't that great? A six-year-old. A six-year-old says, I'm not the brave. I love his honesty. I love his vulnerability and his willingness to say what all of us feel from time to time, right? Not if you're with me. Yeah? No? Just me? Fantastic. That's awesome. <laughs> Nothing like being lonely up here. I'm not the bravest guy around. And I love what he does because if we were that honest and we openly came before the Lord and we poured out our fears and we poured out our heart, what would be different about our life? But it's what happens next in this story that I love. And I'll share it with you a little bit later this morning, okay? I promise I'm going to come to that because this comes out of, a, out of a new book from Ed Young called The Fear Virus. And Ed Young Jr. is an awesome pastor out of uh, Dallas, Fort Worth, at fellowshipchurch.com. Just an incredible thing. And don't worry, he also wrote a book called Courageous Joy or Contagious Joy. So I'm seeing a theme here, and these were written long before the pandemic. So don't take this too too much with today's thing, because this deals with fears that we all face, fears that have nothing to do with a coronavirus, or maybe you've got bigger fears than that, that that's not even the thing that you're thinking of. And as I look around, I'm thinking, what fear are you dealing with today? Because we all have fears. Pastor Bill started this series last week, y'all just didn't know it, as we talked about fear, and we talked about some of those fancy names, and you know, we've got the fear of the future, we've got the fear of the unknown, fear of death, fear of commitment, fear of loneliness. If you don't believe me, just check out your social media feed or turn on the bad local news. Turn on CNN. No, better yet, don't. Don't watch any of it. Tune into this. Tune into this and let this literally saturate your mind like, like, a, like a cleansing rain, right? 
Please nobody take a photo of it. No, Amy, Amy, no, nope. take it off. I'm taking it off. You get, okay, oh, thanks, that's great. Tion's already got a screenshot of it probably. Thanks, buddy. Thank you, buddy. Man, I got to remember, this is going out across the world. I want to ask you a question because we have, we all have fears. I mean, every one of us. What kind of fear are you dealing with today? What kind of fear is it? What, are you, what is it that, that's right in front of your mind right now? Because we all are facing fears, and they may not be the same. You all know what mine is. My, my, my biggest one, I have arachnophobia, and everybody knows it. And I, I, somebody tagged me in a horrible spider thing yesterday. Uh, is that person here? Good, let's talk about them. So <laughs> there was somebody that tagged me, and I looked at it, and it was horrible. They went down, they picked up this thing that looked like black fuzz, and it was like a thousand spiders, and they all just slowly crawled away. Yeah. <laughs> you want to see it? Gail, I'll tag you in it too, okay? We'll make sure we can all spread it. It was like, blah, blah. Anybody have arachnophobia? You're free to admit it? Yeah. Really? Come on. It, front row. You can't lie on the front row. Raise the hand. What about acrophobia? The fear of flying. Anybody have that? Anybody care to admit that? I'm the only one. Thank you, Ed. God bless you. Y'all are lying. Y'all don't want to get in a hollow metal tube with a dude you've never met going at 600 miles an hour, 30,000 feet in the air? <laughs> right? We all have fears. Those, those are two, two of the biggest ones that I have. What, what are your fears? If you're watching at home, are you brave enough to comment? Snakes, yeah. Would you comment? Would you, would you say you're clowns? Anybody have a fear of clowns? Y'all are more afraid of clowns and snake clowns than you are flying and spiders? Man, I don't know my church anymore. Y'all are weird. <laughs> Maybe some of you have pantheraphobia. You know what that is? True story. That is the fear of your mother-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> don't raise your hand. What are you doing? Fear of your mother-in-law. That was pretty good. Some of you who are single may have the fear uh, called gamophobia. That's the fear of commitment and marriage. Hmm. I'm just going to leave that right there. Some of you have check your phonophobia. You know what that is? Yeah, yeah. That's where you can't stand if something's going on without you, or you misplaced your phone, you don't know where it is, now you're freaking out, and you're panicked, and you're like, what is going on? I can't, where is it? What, you know, uh, uh, which leads to another fear, FOMO. Fear of missing out, right? We don't even realize how much technology has played into that until you don't realize it till you lose it, and you've misplaced your phone, and you're calling all your buddies out saying, can anybody please call me right now? Somebody let me know. But I want to... I want you to receive a verse this morning, okay? And I really hope you will open up your heart and let this permeate into your soul. This is 2 Timothy 1.7. It says this, God has not given us the spirit of what? Fear. He's not given us the spirit of fear, but he has given us the spirit of power and love and of a sound mind. Right there, I want you to think about that. We have to think right. We have to process fear properly. And maybe we need to learn to identify the different types of fear. Because I want to ask you a question. Is all fear bad? No, right? I mean, you've got the fear of God. You've got fear that can actually stop you from making foolish decisions. Milo, get down out of the tree, right? I've got to put him in bubble wrap. And, you know, there's different things that, we, that save you from making a foolish decision. You think, maybe that's, I've got a little fear for that. That can actually be healthy. See, there's actually positive fear. And there's negative fear. And what I hope we learn today is during this strange season that we find ourselves in, to lean into the positive fear. Fear of the Lord, fear of God, fear that makes you make good decisions. There's nothing wrong about being a safety pup. <laughs> Trust me, I know. But there can be when I let fear be the thing that dictates everything I do. So you've got positive fear and you've got negative fear. And if you don't believe there is a huge difference I want you to go mix up your battery cables the next time you try to jumpstart your car. <laughs> Anybody recognize these? These are called jumper cables, right? It is a big deal where you hook these up. Or maybe not. To quote the great theologian Michael Scott, to start a car, just clip these anywhere on the engine. <laughs> and watch what happens. Because I read a story just this week of a young man who put the positive on the negative and the negative on the positive of his dad's brand new Lincoln Continental. Oh, you read it too? And he fried it. 
That young boy's looking for a home now. <laughs> Does it matter? See, what happens in our life? We get the positive on the negative and the negative on the positive, you know, and our lives get fried. And today, I want to look at this story in Exodus chapter 14. You can go ahead and pull it up if you want. Exodus 14, where the Israelites are the perfect illustration for us today. And how often we go astray and we take our eyes off of the main thing and we look at these things that cause division. We look at these things that make us speak unkindly to people. And I want to see why the children of Israel acted so afraid when God had just done some amazing things. So if you're not familiar with this, I'll give you, I'll give you a little, a little uh, context for it. Moses shows up and he is about to free up to 2 million, it's estimated, Israelites from Egyptian slavery slavery like it's so many that they are three-fourths of the domestic national product for egypt that's how vital they were okay so they're there and they're doing all this and he shows up and they're freed from slavery and they should have been able to walk through the wilderness to the promised land and what could have taken if they walked straight through a couple days a few days but it didn't take that and it didn't take weeks or months or years it ended up taking decades why what happened what went wrong y'all it comes back to one word fear that's how powerful and visceral this emotion is so if you're ready look with me i'm going to read from the csb translation if you'd like to sync up with me csb starting exodus 14 verse 10 it says this as pharaoh approached the israelites looked up and there were the egyptians coming after them oh boy the israelites were terrified and they cried out to the Lord for help. They said to Moses, Is it because there were no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die here in the wilderness? No, I got to pause there. That, the sarcasm right there is breathtaking. And I want you to watch the patience that Moses has. Okay, all right? Is it because there weren't enough graves? Right, right, okay, all right. Keep going. He says, What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Isn't this what we told you? Here it is right? Here's the finger wagon. What is it? I told you so, right? Anybody ever say that to you? Isn't that great? You are so honest. That's awesome. I told you so. Isn't this what we told you, right? Notice Moses' reaction. Isn't this what we told you in Egypt? Leave us alone so we may serve the Egypt. Y'all, this is disgusting. Notice how they describe what they were doing all these years. We're, we're just serving them. It's a wonderful, mutually beneficial thing. No, you're slaves, you're slaves. You're not punching a clock, getting you know, a six-figure salary, get to go home and enjoy life. You are slaves, working from sunup to sundown. You're being beaten. It is horrible. But notice how quickly they redefine this. They're saying, we were serving the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to, there's that word again, serve the Egyptians and to die here in the wilderness. But Moses said to the people, oh, God bless Moses for his patience, do not be afraid. Stand firm and see the Lord's salvation that he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You must just be quiet. Wow. And I love the message translation. Look at this. This is so good. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up and saw them. Ah, Egyptians coming at them. They were totally afraid. They cried out in terror to God. They told Moses, weren't the cemeteries large enough in Egypt so that you had to take us out here in the wilderness? to die? There's that sarcasm. What have you done to, is this mind-boggling to anybody but me? This is Moses they're talking to. What have you done to us taking us out of Egypt? Back in Egypt, didn't we tell you this would happen? Didn't we tell you? Leave us alone here in Egypt. We're better off as slaves in Egypt than as corpses in the wilderness. Wow. Be honest. If somebody came up to you, if you were Moses, you would throat punch that guy right then and there. <laughs> would you not? Look at what he says. He goes on in verse 14 and says, God will fight the battle for you. You, you just keep your mouth shut. I imagine he said it through Clint's teeth, right? You just keep your mouth shut, right? God bless him. This is incredible. I love it. This is so deep. So I would ask you all a question. Be honest. Don't answer out loud. You ever had a fight with your spouse? Why are you laughing? Don't, don't do that. I hope if you're watching at home online, you're not typing up, yes, we have. Don't do, this was not supposed to be answered out loud. And I don't mean fight like, I mean fight like, um, 
a passionate discussion. How about that? Anybody have that? You ever have one with your parents? Passionate discussion. Or guys, you're driving down the road, and like, you think you're having a great conversation with your wife, and then boom, it starts to intensify, and it becomes like, well, are we really having this discussion? And you're going on and on. You don't even know where you're driving anymore, because you're starting to get a little hot under the collar. And then, boom, out of the blue, man, she dropped something from 12 years ago. Right? <laughs> guys, just admit it. You're not going to win this. Your wife is smarter than you. <laughs> she has a better memory than you do, too. Right? She has a gift. She can go in the Wayback Machine into ancient history and remember stuff because she can go historical like that. You say, Pastor, don't you mean hysterical? No, I definitely am not calling anybody hysterical. I mean historical. And that's the first lesson from the Israelites today. When you are faced with fear, the first truth I want you to write this down, don't go hysterical, go historical. This is so good. If you will lean into this, think about what God has done for you in the past. If Israel would have done this, it could have changed everything. See, we have great memories, right? A lot of you could go historical and stuff. I'm not talking about hysterical. Hysterical is, ah, no, we don't need that. We got enough of that in the world. I'm talking about going historical. They freaked out. They panicked. And when they should have been remembering, God, you're so good. We're on the way to the promised land. I'm remembering all this miracle after miracle you've done. And they just keep complaining and doubting and having this fear, and it keeps stirring up. And they're like, cancel culture, we're done. We're done with Moses. Who next? Who else can we get? You want to lead? Can you? We don't know what's going on because we don't like this. So God says, you know what? Turn around. And he sees this massive wall of chariots coming at him, and they're thundering after him. The scripture says it overtook them. They were coming, and they are chasing. You know, it, it looked bleak. All right, so let me stop and ask you a very serious, profound question. It says that overtook God's people. What about you? What fear? Be honest with yourself. What fear is it that is overtaking your life? You at home. Maybe you're watching online. What fear is it that is right here in front of you and you can't stop thinking about it? Can't stop obsessing about it? Confession? Are pastors allowed to confess? Can we do that? Not if I'm safe. Y'all, about three months ago, I could not stop thinking about COVID. And then God spanked me one day and he said, you're taking your eyes off of Christ. And I realized when I am starting to think more about COVID than I am Christ, my perspective is off. The easiest thing for me to do would be to cower, to withdraw. I could so easily be in the fetal position under my blanket curled up in a full hazmat suit right now. But God said, that's not how you lead your people. And I looked to Moses, and I started thinking, what did you do in this situation? And God says, I told them to make a U-turn. You want to talk about crazy. You want to talk about insane. They're running. They're going. They're, they're, they're flat out on the run. And God says, hey, I'm going to send Moses' GPS alert. He says, stop. Turn around. He's like, hang on. Whoa, wait up. Wait a minute. Everybody stop. Do what? Hey, it says he wants to turn around. <laughs> he wants to stop and turn and face the enemy coming. I don't understand what's going on. You want to talk about crazy? Man, that, that is cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, wackadoodle do. And the people are looking at him like, are you sure this is our leader? We're going to go back into the jaws of death? God, why have you brought us to this dead end? You ever ask that? God, why am I here? You ever ask God why? I mean, why are you even here? You at home, why are you and I on this little blue marble rolling around the sun? Let's go there. Let's ask the questions that no one else was, is willing to ask. Why are we here? Well, the Westminster Catechism did a great job summarizing it. said this, you're here. The chief end of our existence, the reason we're here is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. So you know I got to ask, how you doing with that? Because I got some good friends, I got some family members who I look into their eyes and all I see and sense is fear. And I'm not talking just about virus, I'm talking about fear of the economy, fear of their job, fear of their relationship going south with their children. 
fear of you fill in the blank. Fear. It's real. But I want to show you a verse. Look at Exodus 14, 4, okay? This is so wild. In fact, we're going to do something different. It's so good. I want us all to read it out loud together, even you at home, okay? Are you ready? Say it with me. Three, two, one. I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them. But I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and all his army, and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. And there it is. God is always going to get the glory. God is going to get the glory. We are supposed to be nothing but magnifiers, pointed up, showing his radius. That's it. I'm not supposed to get distracted about this. I'm not supposed to be divisive in my rhetoric. I am supposed to point people to Christ. Bring it back to Jesus. Come back to your first love. And if you go back and you think about the things you're saying, are you radiating this? If you go back, I want you to look at your Twitter feed. I want you to look at your social media. And if you are more obsessed about politics or about a virus or posting about anything else other than Christ, I got to ask, why? Why? The world is looking to you for hope. Our hope's not in a politician. Our hope's not in a vaccine. Our hope is in Jesus. Our hope is in Jesus. What are we doing? What are we doing when we get distracted by these stupid arguments? There's a world dying and going to hell going, well, they're just as scared and interested in side stuff as I am. God, forgive us. We have the hope of the universe, and it shatters our chains, and it gets you out of the corner, and it allows us to move and say, God, at the end of the day, I either believe you hold my life in your hands or you don't. My life is but a vapor. That's it. Because this is just a fragment of real life. A couple days ago, I pulled up in my truck. I had my son with me. Pulled up on the side of the road because the driveway was blocked. And I got out and I walked away and Milo came out my side and as I turned, he asked me a question. I stopped, and I said, whoa. And he just started talking. I said, Milo, you can't stand there. I said, what? No, Dad, I was going to, and he was just going on talking just like he does. And I said, Milo, you can't. What he didn't know was he was standing on a fire ant bed. Oh, you've done that. You ever been there? And like, they slowly climb up, and you don't know that they're there until one telephones another fire ant and says, hey, start biting. And they start, and they all bite at the same time, and you do the craziest dance, right? I'm sitting there looking. He didn't know it was there because now it was dark, but I had seen the danger. Oh, this is so good. I had seen the danger earlier and taken some precautions, which is wise. Nothing wrong with that. But he didn't know about this. So he's standing there talking to him, like, Milo, and I'm like, he's like, what? I'm like, fire ants, dude, lift your feet, do something, stop, drop, and roll, get out of there, right? And he's looking down going, I don't see him. I don't see him. And I'm like, that's exactly how we are, isn't it? We're looking down. We don't know where to go. So we look down and we think, oh, there's danger here. I don't know. But I don't know where to go. So we freeze. We freeze. It's the, especially leadership, man. It's so easy to go, I don't know which way to go. I'll play it safe and do nothing. I'm going to let you know a secret. You're a leader. You are a leader. You at home, you are a leader. If you claim Christ, people are looking to you. You're a leader. And you can't lead from a spirit of fear. You have to lead from a spirit of power and a spirit of love and a spirit of sound mind. Because God will get the glory when we focus on him. God will get the glory. Maybe you're facing a dead end right now in a relationship or your kids emotionally or physically or financially, and it is so easy for you to go hysterical rather than to go historical. But here's the thing. When you're at that dead end, by the way, did you know the name of that valley that they were in was called Pahai Herot? You know what that means in Hebrew? It means the valley of the gorges. 
Not Valley of the Gorgeous. Like, woo, they're pretty. I'm talking a Valley of Gorgeous where it is a canyon all around, a box canyon you cannot get out. Wall of water on one side, Pharaoh coming, see here. And they are sitting there. And then God says, hey, stop, make a U-turn. Man, I get why the Israelites questioned that. I get why they might have whined and complained and blamed Moses for it and said, cancel culture, he's gone, who else we got? They didn't get it. So I'm going to leave you with three things. Three things that I want you to take with you when you face fear this week, when you walk out that door. The first one is this. Don't go hysterical, go historical. In other words, remember how God has delivered you. Go back and look into his word. Go back and think, man, God, you brought me through. Thank you for your love, your grace. You didn't abandon me. And you remind yourself. That's why it's good to write stuff down. That's why it's good to have a prayer journal. And some of you, maybe you're new in the faith. Maybe you're like, you know, Pastor, I, I, I don't get that. I don't have a bunch of, bunch of history like that. I'm just a young Padawan learner. I'm trying to learn my way, but I can't figure out what's going on. I don't have a lot of history. I got the hysterical stuff, <laughs> but I don't have the historical stuff. What if I said, yeah, you do? No, I don't. I'm new. Yeah, yeah, you do. No, I don't. Yeah, you do. It's right here. It's right here. You have the history of God's people. We just read the account of Moses and the Israelites. And we can see promise after promise after promise that's been fulfilled. And we can go historical and say, oh my goodness, God, forgive me. I can't believe I take my eyes off you. I did it again. I've started focusing on my problem instead of the problem solver. And so it takes us coming together across the miles to remind each other, say, hey, buck up, little camper. God's still on his throne. And you are not done yet. So he says, hey, basically go historical. Then he says this, don't deify fear. And that's the second one I want you to write down. In other words, don't make fear more than it is. And that's what I was doing, right? I was starting to make fear become a god, little g, an idol in my life. But in Exodus 14, 10, it says they were terrified. They cried out to the Lord. Remember, hey, God, I'm not the bravest guy around. Remember our opening story? Moses looks and he says this in verse 13, 14. He looks at me and he says, do not be afraid. Maybe it'll have more impact if I say it like Moses. Do not be afraid. There it is, right? Do not be afraid. The Lord will fight for you. And then if you know the story, you know what happens next. God says, move out. <laughs> and there they go. The sea parts. The Egyptians chase, the walls of water crash in on them, they're taken care of, and Israel gets to go, and we are off to the races. And to this day, just like back then, you will still face fears. Fear will come and whisper in your ear. So here's what I want you to do. When you are fearful, I want you to turn faithful. When you are fearful, I want you to lean into our faith. And that's the last thing I want you to seize on today. Fear is an opportunity for faith. Get that. Fear is an opportunity for faith. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. Mm, God is showing me my faith right now. I get it. Trust me, I get it. I am meeting with pastors and experts and doctors and scientists all the time. And the fear is palpable. It's everywhere. But what if I told you that you're already constantly putting your faith in someone or something? Say, no, I don't, I don't have that kind of faith. Oh, yes, you do. You don't know it. What if I told you you were already displaying faith? When John McCaleb comes in and he sat down in that chair, I promise you, right, don't make me a liar, I promise you he didn't get down under the chair and say, I wonder what the weight limit is on this thing before I sit down on it. You at home, sitting on your sofa. I know, don't tell me you did. You didn't check the weight limit on that sofa before you sat there, before all of us put on the COVID-19, right? 19 pounds? None of us do. None of us check the weight limit on that. When those elevator doors opened up and you blindly stepped in faith into that elevator, and there's that guy standing in the corner, so you're like awkwardly kind of go to the other side, and you're, you're reading like the, Inspection, but Sherry Berry, right? <laughs> Sherry Berry inspected this one, you know. You didn't call Sherry Berry and go, hey, Sherry, listen, uh, what's the weight limit of this thing really? Is it really 1,500 pounds? Because I've been eating like bad. And there's a, <clears throat> there's a really big guy in here with me right now. <laughs> you didn't do that. Why? Because you had faith that that unseen cord or that hydraulic lift would hold you. Y'all have faith in God. 
He's better than Sherry Berry's best inspected elevator. Have faith in God. All right, so here's what it is. I'm going to leave you with this challenge. I'm going to go ahead and have our musicians come back up. This is your challenge, okay? And everybody look me in the eyeball. You at home. This challenge is not optional this week. How about that? How's that for bold, huh? This is not optional. Your challenge, and it's not that hard, okay? In fact, I'm going to quiz you on this, so heads up. I run into you in the hallway or at Chili's or at Walmart. I'm going to quiz you on this. Your challenge is to read and digest this verse right here. Whenever I am afraid, I will trust in you. Can you do that? Y'all, it's nine words. <laughs> I'm not asking you to run a marathon here. Your challenge is to read and memorize this between now and Sunday, okay? If you're willing to do that in this room, will you just wink at me? Wink. That's creepy. They can't wink. All right, you at home, if you are willing to do it, will you just type up challenge accepted? Are you brave enough to do that? Would you put challenge accepted out there? Church, would you accept that challenge? It's not that hard compared to what Christ has done for us. But I want, when fear comes your way, I want you to cry out to him and say, I will put my trust in you. I am not going to take my eyes off of you, Lord. I'm not going to look at the water on both sides as I walk through on dry land. I'm going to focus on you. Will you do that? Will you take that challenge? See, once you become a follower of Christ, you are going to face fears. There's going to be some known fears. There's going to be some unknown fears. Where you look down and you are standing in a pile of fire ants. You didn't even know they were there. But I believe God can spare us that. But if he doesn't, know there's a reason for your dead end. Know there is a purpose for the pain. There's a reason for the process you are in. He may cause you to do a U-turn. He may take you through. The point is, live in such a way that gives him the glory. So you don't freeze up. You can deal with life so much better. And God will help you walk through those woods into that field on the other side of the creepy wood. I promised I'd share the end of that story, didn't I? If you come back next week, I, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I love this part. This is so good. Ed Young wrote this story about it. It's his little son, by the way. So EJ's there, and his little friend says, Sir, I'm not going to go because I'm not the bravest guy around. He said after that, you know, I felt for this guy. I just loved his honesty. And then he said this. He said, I leaned in, and I said, little buddy, how about I walk with you through the creepy woods to the field? Would you go then? Really? Yeah. Awesome. He leans over. He takes EJ by the hand. He takes his little buddy, who he just met, by the hand. And he says, and I quote, I walked with them through the woods to the field and there they had a great time playing. <laughs> the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And I have a hard time doing that when I'm obsessed with things other than Christ. Is it okay to admit that to you? Would you be honest enough to admit that? So here's what we're going to do. If you're new here, we like to sing one last song. It's very informal. No one will bother you. You'll see people come and they'll pray maybe 60 seconds, maybe a couple minutes, and they'll lay something at the altar or they'll worship God. Others around you just stand and we sing one last song and that's it. No one will bother you. This is your time to just see how God's calling you to respond. Maybe you want to come and just kneel before him and say, God, you know, I confess I have let this become bigger than you. Or I've got a family member who's struggling with this. Or I've got a, a neighbor who doesn't know you, Jesus, and I lay their name before your throne again. Would you just be obedient? Let me pray for you and we'll open the altar. God, I thank you for your spirit in this place. I thank you for convicting me. I thank you that you didn't leave me as an orphan just to wander around in the dark, creepy woods without a clue, without any hope for the promised land. God, I thank you for my brothers and sisters today and those hearing the sound of my voice across the miles. Lord, I pray that you would soften our hearts in this moment. Holy Spirit, speak to us. You are in this place and you are welcome. You are the guest of honor. In Jesus' name, amen.